So hello everyone, this is C4G. Uh, I hope everyone can see the slides and can hear me. Uh, this is C4G and uh, we'll start with search group status. Uh, Alexei Melnikov, Nick Sullivan and Stanislav Smyshlev as chairs. Uh, this session has been recorded automatically. We have a minute taker. Uh, thank you very much to uh, Alexei. We have a job relay, thanks to Jonathan Holland. Uh, we have our blue sheets automatically generated, and you have a link to the minutes uh, when they will be ready. So you can see the note well. I hope you saw it sometime. Uh, g is a research group of IRTF. Uh, you can uh, look at RFC 7418 uh, to know a little more about IRTF. Uh, the slides are available uh, using this link, and all documents are available in Data Tracker. So we have quite a busy agenda. Uh, we'll start with a safer job date. Then we have uh, a talk on Kangaroo 12, uh, on two pegs that were selected after the peg selection process. Uh, uh, one uh, think, uh, uh, status update about, sorry? One status update about VOPRF, uh, about RSA, blood brand signatures, about frost about Hikimitian AD and about uh, some possible modification of VOPRF that can be needed for privacy pass. Uh, and in other business in the end. Uh, maybe any agenda bash? Uh, yeah, uh, I just want to point out the slides are not advancing. Um, oh. on our, our... Uh, That's what Watson was trying to say. Yes. Um, now we see the agenda. But, um, uh, can you see the agenda now? Yes. Okay. So okay, we'll proceed. To, uh, not in full screen. Sorry. Uh, so um, I can um, uh, replace the slides with uh, some admin trivia. I hope you saw not well. I hope you know the goals of the IRPF. And uh, there are links uh, to the session slides and to the data tracker. So we have quite a busy agenda. Uh, I won't uh, repeat it one more time, I hope. Uh, so let's go to the document status. Um, in fact, we have a lot of new work uh, done from uh, November, but we don't have any new RFCs. Uh, we have one update of Argon 2. Uh, only yesterday there, were, uh, there was a new version, so we hope that Argon 2 will be published uh, before the next meeting, before because it has undergone uh, IETF conflict review and there was only a uh, small comment, so I hope that uh, every concern uh, are, is addressed now. Uh, we have HPK document uh, after research group last call and after document separate review. Uh, it's in the IRTF chair review uh, queue. Uh, and we have plenty of uh, active CFRG drafts. Uh, So, uh, about spec to draft. Uh, uh, it has been updated, uh, and the service group last call uh, has uh, finished successfully. Uh, now we are waiting for Shepard's review, it's mine review. Uh, we have some questions to be uh, addressed, so I hope that we'll proceed in a, a couple of weeks. Uh, we don't have any changes with Heftaker draft. Uh, we have updated uh, VRF draft. Now it's in the search group last call status. Uh, the Kangaroo 12 draft has been updated and we'll have a presentation about Kangaroo 12 today. 
Uh, the URF has been updated too, uh, no other news with it. Uh, no news about BLS draft. Uh, a major update of uh, parent friendly curves, and now we are waiting for uh, a second residual plus call. Uh, we have an updated version of AED limits draft uh, and uh, about uh, in, uh, both pack drafts, OPEC and CPACE. We'll have presentations about both of them today. Uh, the first draft has been adopted and we'll have a presentation in the agenda today. Uh, so the crypto review panel is still working, uh, is still providing good reviews and uh, still happy to do new reviews for the Cypher G or for any other uh, requests from ISC or uh, IF groups. So uh, let's move to the slides. And since uh, some people wanted the slides to be shared to the full screen and uh, there seems to be some technical issues on my side, uh, can I ask Nick? to project slides from his side. Uh, just a second, Colin's in the queue. Let's take a question from him. Hi, uh, yeah, J just for on, on the uh, draft, uh, yeah. so that's, uh, if you can hear me. Yes. Yes, yes. OK. Uh, so uh, for, for HPKE, my, my apologies. I, I know this has been waiting for me for a while. Um, I, I have not forgotten um, that the pandemic is rather getting in the way, but uh, I hope to get to it uh, shortly. Um, for the um, the Argon, um, the, the, is it Argon 12? I'm forgetting the acronym. Um, it, it, if uh, the, the chairs can just confirm uh, that, that the changes uh, um, uh, satisfactory, then I'll get that moving quickly. Okay, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll check. I just saw the updated version this week, but I didn't get around to it yet. So, yeah, okay, thank you. Uh, Argon 2 was uh, updated only yesterday, uh, so we hope to uh, see it uh, in a couple of days. And about the HPK, uh, Colin, thanks a lot for a lot of comments from your side because I think that uh, a lot of improvements of HPK was done uh, after your first review. So I hope that uh, no more big issues with HPK will occur before the next stage. Uh, Nick, could you please share the slides? Uh, now we only say that screen share has been, oh, yes, we see it. Uh, so please, uh, Jill, uh, Kangaroo 12, please start. Hello, can you, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you, please start. Okay, thank you. So um, yes, my name is Gilles Van Ash. I work for ST Microelectronics in Belgium, and I'm one of the editors of the draft on Kangaroo 12. So I would like to thank you for this opportunity, and I would like to make a brief status of the draft. Um, can you go to the next slide, please? Thank you. So um, as a starter, here here is a quick refresh about Kangaroo 12. So it's a hash function, or more precisely, a ZOF, an extendable output function, because it has a variable output size. And it's based on the NIST standard Shake 128. So the differences between Shake 128 and Kangaroo 12 are the two main differences are first, we reduce the number of rounds um, from 24 to 12 rounds. And the second change is that we added a mode of operation that can exploit parallelism and, in particular, SIMD instruction sets. Um, so the result is a ZOF that is at the same time secure and fast, of course. Um, so it's not my purpose to to discuss again why it's secure and fast because I think Benoit did that uh, fine a few times already. So that's uh, that's not the goal. I'm just going to give you a couple of hints. Um, but um, so about security, the key point is that Kangaroo 12 reuses the cryptanalysis of the reduced round Ketchak or Chat3. So the uh, the round function is exactly the same, which means that we can rely on more than 10 years of cryptanalysis by the community. So for instance, as of, as of today, the best um, collision pre-image and uh, second pre-image attacks against 
Shake 128 work only up to five rounds. And so the, go, the same goes for Kangaroo 12. So about the speed, um, it's faster than MD5, SHA-1 or SHA-2, especially when the processor has, uh, has IND instruction sets. And for instance, if you take um, the Skylake X or Cascade Lake architectures, then Kangaroo 12 tops at about half a cycle per byte, which is um, roughly seven times faster than SHA-1 on, on that platform. And well, in general, it's, it's faster than SHA-2 and SHA-3. Um, can you go to the next slide, please? Thank you. So here is a log of um, the draft. So it became a working group item in August 29, 20, 2019, sorry. Um, then we, yeah, we fixed some typos. Uh, we had the, the chance of getting some uh, reviews from the crypto review panel from uh, Jean-Philippe Masson and Thomas Pornin, and we integrated these, um, the, their comments in versions 02 and 03, together with the comments from Stephen Farrell. We also received some, some uh, requests for clarification from Pascal Junot, and these were integrated in um, version 04. Then uh, Nick uh, um, sent a last call in October last year. There was a one mail of positive feedback from Christoph Dobronik, and then a reminder. Um, yes, version 05 is just because Benoit needed to change his email address. And finally, we've got some comments from Mark Pending Rogers, which I think we addressed. I mean, at least we um, proposed um, something that would address, which is simply one um, sentence to, to be added to, at the end of, of the document. Um, but he didn't confirm if, if that was OK for him or not yet. So um, that's, that's the status, I would say. Um, so globally, we've received uh, positive feedback but not that much feedback, especially after the, the last call. So um, we thought that at this point, it would be a good idea maybe to, to stress again our motivation for suggesting Kango 12. Um, and that's, yeah, that's the purpose of, of this presentation, basically. Um, can you go to the next slide, please? Thank you. So the question is, why do we think that Kango 12 is actually interesting for the internet community? And I see two sets of arguments. Um, the first main arguments about are about the implementation properties. So um, we think that these implementation properties are quite unique among hash functions or symmetric crypto primitives in general. So specifically, our run function uses only bitwise degree two operations like XORs and ends and rotations. And this means that when it's implemented in the hardware, the critical path is really short. So this explains why Kachak is fast in hardware as well as energy efficient. But even if you're not interested in hardware implementation per se, of course, a CPU is a piece of hardware. So this may have an impact in, in the long run. Um, to illustrate that, if you take the AVX512 instruction set, there is a new instruction that can perform any bitwise operation on three operands. So you can just specify the truth table of, of this operation. And this is an example of an instruction that I think is possible thanks to the short critical path of such operations. Um, another important in implementation aspect is when one has to protect against spe special kinds of side channel attacks like uh, uh, differential power analysis, DPA. And we know that these protections are quite expensive, but uh, um, the degree two operations make these protections less expensive than on ARX designs or even the, the AES. So in the end, I think Kango 12 has nice implementation properties that other primitives usually don't have. And at least this brings some good diversity in, in the portfolio of symmetric uh, primitives. Um, the second set of arguments is more, I would say, economical. It's about reuse of things that were already done. So first is um, cryptanalysis. So cryptanalysis takes a significant time and effort and Kango 12 can, can leverage on these investments. We can reuse all the cryptanalysis done on Ketchak since um, 2008. Um, another point is the reuse of implementations. So obviously we can reuse code from Shatri and adapt it to Kango 12 quite easily. Uh, but I'm, I also have in mind a um, 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 recent trend that some, some vendors are adding hardware assistance for different standard uh, hash functions. And for instance, ARM has defined some SHA-3 instructions in their 64-bit processor optional instructions. So um, Kango 12 can benefit from these instructions. 
And as a matter of fact, these instructions are present in the latest Apple A14 and M1 processors. And concretely, if, you, if you're interested in, in some, some figures um, based on benchmarks from Andy Polyakov, I expect that Kango 12 can run at less than one cycle per byte on the M1. And to compare apples to apples, if you consider the hardware accelerated 512 on the same platform, it would be twice, uh, at least twice faster. So yeah, just, just to, to sum up, I think that these points are, at least they convince me that Kango 12 is something interesting and valuable for the community. And actually that's all I wanted to say. So thank you very much for your attention. Thanks a lot, Jim. Any questions? Someone runs, go on twice. Uh, okay, then, thanks a lot. Thank you. Uh, please, Bjorn Hasse, uh, raise the presentation about the current status of CPA's draft. It's the balanced uh, pack uh, that was the winner of pack selection contest last year. Uh, so we have the CPA's draft updated recently. So Bjorn, please uh, tell us about the current status. So hello, can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. OK, so uh, I'll take your slide there. I'd like to give you an update on the current uh, uh, progresses regarding the CPACE draft. Up. Do you see my screen now or? Up. Uh, no, I'm right? OK, okay wait a moment. Should be there now? Yes. OK. So. To, to give you an update, the, basically the news is that we have now completed the security analysis uh, for CPAs in different variants. And uh, uh, the, uh, we have published it in a paper which is online, which also has seen review, so that we are convinced and have uh, sound uh, results that uh, also the results that the new results in, this, in the paper are sound. So the results in a nutshell are that uh, uh, the different uh, uh, CPACE protocol variants that we uh, considered consider in the current draft provide strong security guarantees. So we have um, composability and adaptive security under uh, relaxed assumptions, which is the strong simultaneous Diffie-Hellman assumption, which is less than we had previously. It's a decisional Diffie-Hellman type assumption. The main part is that we closely looked at the properties that we need for the map to point primitive. Um, uh, previously, uh, the maps uh, have been considered as a random oracle, and uh, in our, our analysis, we were able to remove this requirement and extract the actual needs that we uh, and the requirements that we have to impose on the uh, mapping primitive. So, good news is that. All the security relevant properties that we actually need are fulfilled, fulfilled by the maps which are defined by the hash to curve draft. And potentially we believe that um, our strategy might be also be useful for analyzing the constructions in the OPRF draft. Uh, basically one important uh, result of our analysis is that we don't actually need non-uniform maps uh, uh, for security. CPACE is also secure uh, in, in the restructure construction, and the cofactor does not impact security. For the next step, uh, we have sketched our plan for the RFC and the, and the strategy uh, in Appendix F of the, the paper. And, and our objective has been to um, uh, take the perspective of a user of CPACE, uh, which will probably try to minimize the need of adaptions in his existing ecosystem when trying to integrate uh, CPACE there. We have identified three subsystems and uh, um, uh, chosen three tailored variants, which the first one is uh, uh, considering implementation on single coordinate letters, such as X25519. 
And the second uh, ecosystem would be uh, implementation that use uh, group abstractions such as, such as Restretto. And the third uh, uh, ecosystem uh, would be implementations that use conventional short wire stress uh, 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 approaches, for instance, NIST P256. So for X25519, we would be using a uni non uniform alligator 2 without cofactor clearing. And as a result, a CPACE implementation will only need alligator 2 in addition to X25519 or X448. And we have analyzed uh, whether uh, um, the um, present uh, sampling process for secret Scala that is used for these primitives, which is also known as Scala clamping, is secure also for CPACE, and that's the case. So um, uh, there, uh, um, and there's also no need for an explicit uh, additional point verification code since uh, um, X25519 and X448 have twist security and um, uh, we, this, uh, uh, given that, we uh, just need to check for the neutral elements. So existing X25519 and X448 is suitable for CPACE as is. Similarly, for Restretto and DCAF, uh, we would be using uh, the built-in uniform map tries and add construction that comes with the abstraction. Um, and uh, also there, uh, uh, slightly non-uniform sampling of secret scalars that is commonly, commonly used there is also no problem for CPACE. And point verification is enforced by the um, encode and decode primitives. So this will make CPACE implementations most straightforward for a strato. We found a, a, a sample implementation online, which we plan to use for, te, uh, for deriving test vectors. For short wire stress, um, we would be using the non-uniform and code to curve construction from the hash to curve draft. And uh, of course, in this uh, uh, subsystem, conventional point verification is mandatory. And also uh, some care has to be taken when reusing existing uh, libraries which target uh, ECDH only at the moment, because uh, for CPACE one should really make sure that the uh, secret scalars are sampled uniformly. So for instance, rejection sampling. Uh, for the session keys, we will uh, be using the X coordinate only. So to give more flexibility to implementers to choose also single coordinate letter uh, multiplication strategies, which exist also for short wire shots. Regarding implementations, there is not much new you from our side, uh, but there are, uh, we found uh, several implementation prototypes in Go and Rust online, which we are looking at at the moment. And our main topic is uh, at the moment we are working on uh, a reference implementation based on uh, in, in ANSI C for the short wire stress implementation. So, but in addition to the work that we are doing as an editor team, we are actively looking for partners which would be interested in uh, having uh, pre preparing a CPACE integration into different crypto libraries. We believe that it might, for instance, be an interesting student project, uh, um, instructive student project, and uh, we would um, be welcome and ha happy if somebody uh, uh, would be uh, raising his hand and saying, okay, we think uh, that might be an interesting uh, topic and we'd li like to join. We are contacting different teams and universities, but uh, if anybody is, uh, has, is interested, um, uh, it would be welcome if you uh, uh, get into touch with us. So we think that having others implemented would be a good real-world test for readability and completeness of the draft and, uh, of course, um, improve uh, interoperability tests. Regarding the test vectors, there's not much news. We have in the last draft, we have incorporated, incorporated feedback um, because it turned out that out in the wild, there are different X25519 variants which require or uh, don't require fully reduced field elements for the public points. And we have incorporated that in the draft. So summing up, uh, we think uh, that the main use uh, is the uh, is the security analysis. Interesting, it might be interesting for the OPRF team uh, uh, to have a look at the proof strategy that we chose for CPACE, uh, because in my perception, 
uh, handling, dealing with the uh, map is one of the more difficult aspects, which uh, uh, is also a problem or an issue, uh, a topic for the OPRF constructions that use uh, diffie Harman on elliptic curves. So we think that uh, our uh, approach might also be provide a blueprint for uh, uh, avoiding that the map is modeled as a random oracle for the OPRF constructions. And we believe that it will all most probably also allow for a more efficient single coordinate uh, letter when using a non-uniform map there. So secondly, on regarding the hash to curve draft, we have reviewed it and uh, we think it's very well written and very clear. Um, in our perception, it would be nice to have the uh, exact requirements um, uh, that we need for, need for security for CPAs integrated it. So basically the inversion property, invertibility property, which is already in a, there in a subsection, but might be a bit more prominent. And on our wish list, it's not a must, but on our wish list would be to have a non-uniform and code to curve primitive and uh, hash to curve draft. Um, and this one uh, without, without clearing the cofactor because we believe that clearing the cofactor would anyway be uh, something which um, any application level or protocol level would have to deal with, with which is on top, uh, one layer higher than the, um, the hash to curve layer. So we think that it might be not be the best place to have um, cofactor consideration on the hash to curve level, but rather on the application level or the um, uh, protocol level, which uh, is using the results of hash to curve. Okay, and finally, we uh, I'd like to invite. Uh, I think it's a good idea to join forces for reference implementation with uh, the BOPRF and hash to curve team. I've already been in, in touch with Christopher Wood, but uh, 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 I'd like like to ask anybody to uh, uh, give us an, a short note when we are working working on reference implementations using maps and uh, 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 we would be informing you and uh, would be happy if you keep us synchronized of your advances there. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot, Bjorn. Uh, can I have the first question, if possible? Uh, there is uh, great news that uh, you have such a great improvement with the proof, uh, but uh, my question was, about um, the implementations. Uh, if you I can remember, during the pack selection process, there were some questions about um, identities that must be exchanged and uh, arranged before the actual protocol. Uh, mm -hmm. Do you uh, feel that uh, you occur some problems with uh, implementing a CPACE uh, with integration with some protocols? or there are no problems and all identities uh, can be uh, established before the protocol itself. So in, indeed, the, the present uh, protocol specification in the draft integrates the uh, identities as part of the channel identifier into the, um, uh, into, um, into the protocol. We have discussed that in the, also in the editor team, and we see uh, currently two, uh, two ways uh, to, uh, to deal with that. So in applications where we have the identities established beforehand, there's one, uh, uh, the straightforward way is to, uh, to integrate it in, into the channel identifier field in the beginning. And uh, in applications where it's only established as part of the, um, uh, um, the, uh, um, the protocol, one could not easily integrate it in the beginning, but um, and one will you lose at this point um, the fact that the identities are authenticated as well. But one could use the, uh, the identities and insert the identities in uh, a, f a final um, key confirmation round, as it is done, for instance, by, by TLS. And so in our opinion, it's not a real problem as it uh, will become part of the uh, authenticated um, as part of the hash of the, over the transcript in the higher level construction. And, uh, so and that's... Um, yes. 
so that's the pr the present the present state uh, uh, of this discussion and there also has been some feedback on the list and in the current draft we have uh, in the current version of the draft the identities are uh, uh, marked as recommended but not strictly mandatory and as a part of the proof of course everything which is not integrated as a part of the channel identifier will not be authenticated so uh, any other questions? Yes, Armando, please. Uh, hi. So, did you mention that uh, it would be desirable to have a uh, non critical factor in the hashtag group draft? So, in which cases this is an issue? Um, this provides uh, uh, the advantage is that um, um, when uh, when you clear the cofactor, if you uh, if you use a map for instance such as alligator, you will receive the result of um, of the mapping operation in um, in uh, uh, affine coordinates. And when if you start of start with um, Removing the cofactor, you basically multiply by uh, by the um, the cofactor. You will receive the result in projected coordinates, and you will have an additional uh, inversion operation which you need in order to get it back to a theme coordinate, so that you could use uh, the most efficient uh, algorithm, uh, scalar multiplication algorithm, which works on the theme coordinates. And that's the uh, uh, the efficiency loss that you have that you have an additional. Uh, um, a, an additional inversion, which is not necessary security-wise, and it adds uh, on uh, on implementation complexity. Of it. I, I think uh, keeping all in projective coordinates can can work, and also the scalar multiplication. I mean, the cofactor multiplication is just multiplied by times four or times eight. So I I don't think it's a big issue, but we can analyze this later. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you, Armando. Please, Watson. With alligator specific, well, okay, we don't need to get into the SRG thing. Um, I do worry. What happens when someone comes along and defines another elliptic curve? How much work is there? Do you need to go write a CPEG for this new curve, or is it generic enough that if all that if it's it's in the, one of the categories for the hash to curve draft, things will just work and people will know what to do? And it's really only the examples where these three integrations matter and the test vectors. So, so basically, the, the, the news is all of the different constructions are secure and there's no risk security wise. It's just uh, ease of implementation. For instance, uh, uh, if you use the map, if you're using Ristretto, you probably won't be using the map which is currently defined in the hash to curve draft because. Uh, um, uh, they are having a different construction uh, uh, and different uh, build in primitive, which does not match the, um, um, the uh, uh, implementation, which is in the hash to curve draft. So um, uh, security wise, we don't have a, uh, have a problem. It's just ease of implementation. Uh, uh, if you uh, um, uh, consider the different existing code Thank you. Any other questions? Uh, I think no. Then thanks a lot, Bjorn. Uh, please uh, let's proceed to the OPEC. Uh, so OPEC was the uh, winner of uh, pack selection process for augmented uh, packs. So please, Chris, are you ready? Can someone throw up the slides for me? Uh, Nick, could you please share them because I had some issues with this post full screen. I can try that again, but... Thanks, Nick. 
uh, full, please. Oh, sorry, sorry, it's, uh, not the uh, the OPEC slides. Yes. So please, right. please start. Uh, all right, thanks. Yeah, so this is just an update on OPEC. Um, next slide, please. Um, uh, Stanislav already kind of gave it away, but uh, opaque uh, for those who are young familiar um, is a uh, basically it's an asymmetric uh, password authenticated key exchange protocol that takes a number of uh, cryptographic primitives, glues them together, um, and, and builds something quite nice. Uh, next slide, please. The protocol basically runs in two phases. There's an offline registration phase wherein clients use their password uh, to register public key credentials with the server um, that are then stored in the server and then used later on in an online phase uh, for authentication, wherein clients will use their password again to recover these credentials and then perform an authenticated, a uh, mutually authenticated key exchange. Um, and there's a number of different authenticated key exchanges you could use. Um, number of different credentials you could use, uh, but this document takes a sort of uh, opinionated stance and specifies a singular AKE based on uh, 3DH um, uh, with sufficient accommodations for future um, authentic key exchange protocols if we want them later on. So perhaps something based on Sigma, based on HMKB. Um, the delta between what's there currently for 3DH and what's needed for Sigma or HMQB or, or similar variants is, is quite small and really only varies and how the AKE specific piece does authentication with the public key credentials and how the, the key exchange transcript is computed. So the rest of opaque sort of the core um, uh, remains the same and should be shared across all instantiations. Uh, next slide, please. So between uh, the last meeting and now, uh, there have been uh, a number of updates to the draft, uh, some major and some minor. Um, the major pieces that the, the whole thing was sort of massively fact, refactored based on feedback from Eric Crockett, um, AWS and Amazon, um, to sort of make it clear what is sort of the offline phase and what is sort of the online phase um, and what's essentially to be done for uh, the online phase. Uh, that is both sort of the, the, the credential uh, recovery step as well as the authentic key exchange step. Um, so hopefully it's much more clear now. Uh, we also uh, previously had sort of an odd balance in terms of things that were parameterized and things that were pinned in or baked into the document. So we had this hard dependency on HKDF and HMAC and so on. Um, so to accommodate uh, particular implementations that may want to use different Macs, so maybe CBC Mac or something like that, um, but we've now abstracted over all of the, the underlying primitives such that anyone can plug in things that have conformed to these, the, these various interfaces um, and the the, the protocol should, should work and um, uh, be safe to use. We've also uh, done a lot to sort of prune and fix the, the wire format of the protocol so that um, uh, implementations uh, have a less difficult time parsing things, uh, serializing things, and so on. Um, uh, with the exception of, I think, two fields off the top of my head, that is the, the, the identifiers that are used uh, for client and server and um, arbitrary application info that's exchanged during the authenticated key exchange step. Everything else is a fixed size um, and easily parsable. So um, that should help. Uh, some minor things as well. Um, previously, the, the transcript for 3DH was uh, minimal in terms of uh, what it actually included for security. Um, uh, this was sort of an implementation headache in that it was, uh, there were sort of two different transcripts, one for actually key derivation than another for um, computing the um, the Mac and the, the the actual key exchange for key confirmation. Um, so we did as TLS does and just folded everything that was sent over the wire into the transcript um, to simplify the implementation and sort of uh, the, the specification as well. Um, we also added a suggested uh, password file serialization format. Um, the password file is the thing that the server stores uh, that uh, has like the users or the client's uh, credentials in it. Um, and the, the purpose of this is that uh, OPEC can be sort of treated as the black box on the server side that outputs password files that are then written to disk as just bytes, blobs of bytes. And then 
uh, read from disk and potentially put back into the, um, the relevant APIs to be parsed. Um, but servers and implementations are, of course, free to you know, store these things, serialize them however uh, they want. But you know, there's just a recommendation in there. And finally, uh, we added test vectors, uh, which goes nicely into the next slide. Um, uh, these test vectors are, uh, uh, we use them to interop with uh, several different implementations. There's a reference implementation in Sage um, based on the, the underlying reference implementations in Sage for the OPRF as well as um, hash to curve. Uh, and that has achieved interop uh, with OPKE, um, with the uh, Ristretto, and uh, with, I believe, Ristretto, P256, and maybe another uh, curve in a, in a separate Go implementation. And I'm aware of uh, others that are on the way as well, um, having yet achieved interop, but um, uh, are, are quickly approaching. So um, uh, things are looking good on the implementation front. Um, Next slide. All right, so there are basically two open, two big-ish open issues um, right now, and, and we have, I think we have clarity in terms of what we want to do for both of them, so I'll talk about both of them now. Um, the first of which is how we actually store private keys. Um, so, so currently in the document, um, the, the credentials as they're stored on the server uh, always encrypt a private key um, that the client provides to the protocol. Um, and uh, this is interesting because if you're a user interacting with the server and you know, uh, you know the username to use, um, you know the password to use, you can interact with the server, get the credentials, and recover the private key. Um, and by in, in doing that, what you have to do is like compute an OPRF or run an OPRF protocol with the server, um, and that OPRF output is like used to like derive a key that's then used to later decrypt the credentials. Um, basically, if you know the right inputs, you can compute this OPRF output and decrypt your private key and then use that to authenticate. Um, so the observation was made that um, rather than storing any like encrypted version of key on the server at all, why not just use the output of the OPRF, which uh, protects the key as, as it's stored, um, to, to derive a key sort of in line, uh, so to deterministically derive a key. Um, and that would allow uh, applications without any uh, sort of external key generation function to just use opaque out of the box, um, derive keys, and, and have one less input. So the, uh, the proposal uh, here is to sort of um, shuffle things around slightly such that there's effectively two high-level modes. Um, one, which we're calling an internal mode, wherein keys are deterministically derived based on the output of the OPRF protocol. And then another, uh, which is an external mode, wherein keys uh, or applications that have keys that exist externally to OPEC can import them and you state them in the credential file um, uh, and then recover them later on. And this should accommodate um, things that are, um, uh, I, I guess, both types of applications. Um, and uh, potentially, if there's weird uh, AKEs in the future that don't have you know, nice deterministic key generation functions, uh, they can just use the external mode. Richard? Just a quick clarifying question on this external mode. Um, this seems, seems like this complicates the API, complicates the, the, the architecture a bit. Um, is there a, a reason that folks are, that someone's interested in using external keys here? Because otherwise it seems like a necessary complication to, to have another interface here. Um, so the, the primary motivation was uh, trying to keep this future proof and in terms of like what you know, potentially there might be AKEs in the future wherein the actual deterministic key derivation function is is not specified. Um, I agree that um, uh, it is a, a bit more complicated. And no, we don't currently have a use case in mind specifically for um, 3DH right now. Uh, we know how to deterministically derive keys for these groups, um, and we could get away with just using internal mode. Um, but external mode is there specifically um, and solely for um, uh, you know, future use cases wherein um, uh, that sort of derivation is not clear. Um, I realize that may not be uh, an answer everyone likes, but that's that's the rationale. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's, that seems fair enough. It also seems like you could add this uh, flexibility point in the future version. But we, yeah, we discussed. 
yeah um uh, the the details are subtle enough in terms of like um uh, how you actually protect the envelope um because you need certain requirements for how you encrypt the envelope like you need uh, like a key committing aead effectively um it, it, we kind of work around that and slightly do, in, in in a certain way um and actually there we talk on that later so we, we felt it was appropriate to deal with it now and rather than sort of delegate it to future specifications that might be tempted to uh potentially do that encryption incorrectly um but yeah thanks makes sense thanks um next slide please um the second issue um is uh sort of uh, threat model specific um uh, so currently, uh, in, in the, the current version of the protocol, it's possible for an active attacker uh, who's interacting with the server to sort of actively uh, query, uh, you know, certain username, password guesses and learn whether or not um, a user exists or does not exist. And then also learn if a user does exist, if the password is correct or not correct. And if you compare this to other, you know, authentication systems wherein uh, it's possible for the server to reply indistinguishably, I, um, you know, the user doesn't exist or the password is wrong. Um, this is somewhat of a regression. Um, and there's, there's, uh, th so there's two things we can do to sort of mitigate this. Um, the first of which is uh, to specify sort of optional server side behavior, um, wherein if uh, a user doesn't exist, uh, the server generates, quote, a, a fake response, a deterministic response, but it's fake. Um, uh, and this this means that like if an adversary uh, given a snapshot of all the users in time queries the server um, and the user doesn't exist, uh, it will get back it will get back an answer. Um, if it does exist, it will get back a different answer. Um, it just won't know if the password was right or wrong. Um, the problem with this is that then later on, if this user uh, is added uh, to the system. Um, or if the user um, that does exist password, if like credentials change under the hood or something, the server's response changes and the adversary can learn some information. Um, so the, the second option is to be a bit, uh, is to sort of augment the protocol slightly um, uh, to make this sort of non-optional, um, wherein uh, the server effectively uh, encrypts its entire response uh, to, the, to, the, to the client. Um, and what this allows the server to do is, in the case of a non-existent user, just generate random bytes or random garbage. Um, so from the attacker's perspective, they effectively learn no useful information as to whether or not the username exists, the password was right or wrong, and so on. Um, and we seem to have found a, a, a fairly, um, a minimally invasive way to do uh, the second option, um, uh, which requires uh, sort of minimal storage on the server um, and uh, yeah, we think is pretty reasonable to implement. Um, the details are in the linked issue if you want to check it out. Um, uh, but uh, currently we're leaning towards going towards that. Um, and there's a pull request up for review. Um, but if folks have you know opinions on the, either of the the I guess the applicability of either of these attacks, we'd be interested to hear them. Um, next slide, please. Um, so after we resolve these two issues, uh, we should be ready to go. Uh, we expect to update all the implementations as well as the test vectors accordingly, and then uh, hope, hopefully ask for um, research group last call. Um, that's it. Thanks a lot, Chris. Uh, any questions? Uh, one question from my side uh, regarding the client enumeration issue. Uh, could you please uh, get back one slide to the issue number 24? Yes, thank you. Oh, sorry, uh, 22, yes. Uh, about the, no, the next slide, yes. Thank you. So about the second option. Uh, Chris, could you please tell us more about the second option regarding the changes in the protocol? Uh, don't these changes uh, uh, have any influence on uh, the security proofs, on security assessments, etc.? Or, or are there, uh, there are quite uh, technical changes that do not affect uh, security proof at all? Yeah, the changes don't affect the security proofs. Um, uh, Yugo has confirmed that. Um, 
it's it's this is more of I guess an application layer attack sort of thing. Um, uh, I, I, yeah, I, I guess the I don't know how many how much detail you want about the particular change. Um, uh, uh, I'll simply say that things are unaffected. Uh, your word is enough. So if you say that uh, you <laughs> that as an integrator, that's enough for now. I, 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 I'm just relaying Hugo's word as well. <laughs> okay, thank you. Uh, any other questions? Uh, then thanks a lot to Chris. That's a great work with OPEC. I believe that the uh, draft is really uh, nearly ready to be uh, ready for the group of code. Uh, then let's go to the VOPRF. Discussion, please, Armando. Yeah, uh, Bridget, please present. All right, my name is Armando Fass. Um, I'm going to present about uh, BOPRF draft. Uh, OK, next, next slide, please. Yeah, well, this is basically one slide refresher about the protocol. So um, this is a two-party uh, uh, client-server protocol. So the client knows some input deck. The server holds a private key K, and they um, interact in order to compute the uh, accept the random function that outputs this uh, information Y that is only known by the client. But uh, in, in this sense, uh, the protocol is oblivious because the client only learns the output without learning anything about the, the, the server key. And uh, at the same time, the server doesn't learn anything about the client's input and output too. Uh, another mode is uh, the verifiable, verifiability mode in this uh, construction in which uh, the server also gives a proof to the client that uh, that the output was computed actually using the the key k, uh, and the player has the ability to verify that <clears throat> that the proof is correct. Okay, uh, next slide. Right. So this is our uh, list of the latest changes uh, that was done in in the in the current version. So uh, the the first two are based from removing one of the input which which is uh, uh trying to uh, enforce the, the domain separation as part of the input so we give recommendation for that um issue 239 is uh, some updates on proof on the proof generation uh basically it's just updating the interface in order to be uh, usable uh, in, in order to have a, a clear interface of, of the uh, discrete logarithm proof. Uh, the last issue there is uh, about uh, using shake uh, function for the decaf group. So this is this happened because uh, it's likely that implement, implementation for cure 448 uh, are likely accompanied by, by shake. So it, it makes sense to change from, from SHA to shake. Uh, next slide, please. Yeah, uh, so there are uh, some uh, current issues uh, that uh, we are discussing right now. This is uh, one proposal. One new proposal is trying to put a verifier mo mode which doesn't use uh, zero knowledge proofs at all. So this construction was published in, in this print, uh, 2020 uh, Yeah, basically, no proof is transmitted and only presents. Uh, changes on the client side. Uh, server is, uh, still computes um, this scalar multiplication, k times uh, t0. And basically, on the left is what is in the in the current mode. And uh, on, on the right is, uh, is the, the new proposal. Basically, it adds some uh, point that can be uh, one additional point that can be used as, as a mask. Uh, and this can be cleaned using the, the the public key of the of the server. 
So in order to verify a, a set of tokens or a, a set of, uh, uh, the, because there, there, are, there is no proof in this case, so the client needs to do um, a linear combination of tokens and then uh, do a, an issuance operation. So this is one way that the client can verify tokens without using an explicit proof. Uh, next slide, please. Um, there's another uh, a very recent issue or uh, warning, let's say, about uh, how to do blinding. So, okay, so here just to to set some notation. So we work in a group in multipl multiplicative notation. So basically, the the main result of, of the paper or or that is pointing is that exponential blinding is safe, for, but there are some use cases in which the multiplicative blinding could be unsafe. So, uh, so there are there is one proposal to do uh, in how we can do uh, depart from this is on uh, issue two two hundred forty one and and yeah. So uh, next slide, please, which is my final slide, uh, just to. Uh, hear the questions and also uh, in response to uh, the CPA's uh, talk. So yeah, we can coordinate about the, the implementation efforts. Thank you. Great. Thanks a lot, Armando. Uh, questions, comments? Uh, we'll get back to some issues regarding the uh, VOPRFs because uh, we have our last presentation for today in, a, in an hour uh, from uh, somewhat about uh, VOPRF with public metadata. So some questions may raise during that presentation. Um, do you have any questions now? Hold once, hold twice. Okay, thanks a lot, Armando. Uh, then our next item, RSA blind signatures, uh, Chris Wood. Yep. Um. All right. Um, are we good? Yes. Great. Yeah, so this is a, a proposal for uh, bringing something that, that people use quite widely um, and have been using for a long time to see if we're to see if there's interest in um, standardizing this uh, uh, quite useful tool. So, uh, next slide, please. Um, so, motivation Armando just gave a talk on VOPRFs, uh, but I'll summarize uh, uh, sort of the high level functionality here. Um, uh, VOPRF uh, is, is effectively a multi party protocol for computing this, uh, this PRFF. Um, given a server, server, server secret key K and client input X um, uh, and in such a way that the server learns nothing of the client's input X and the client only learns the output Y. Um, pretty simple. Next slide, please. Um, and uh, th this a tremendously simple uh, functionality has found its way into a number of different applications of uh, privacy pass perhaps being the, the first one at a larger scale. Um, but there's also been sort of uh, a number of alternative applications that require a similar functionality, um, but with sort of different constraints. Um, so Tor has came up come up with a proposal for um, applying uh, something that has the shape of a VOPRF for denial of service prevention um, to sort of help uh, uh, check that things connecting to relays are 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 authenticated and tested at some point. Um, there's also been a proposal for using um, something like VOPRFs for uh, I click fraud prevention um, up in the W3C space. Uh, and uh, VOPRFs don't quite work for some of these cases, um, uh, primarily because uh, in order for them to be useful, uh, it requires either widely shared secrets, because only the owner of the private key can actually uh, verify that uh, the PRF was actually computed correctly. Um, or you centralize access to this key and induce heavy load on the thing that actually is performing VOPRF evaluations. And if this is like an HSM or something like that, 
um, you potentially uh, are, it, it, you, you run into potential scaling issues. Um, next slide, please. Um, so blind signatures uh, can help here. Uh, blind signatures um, are functionally quite similar to VOPRFs uh, with the distinction that the, the outputs are publicly verifiable, um, which is quite nice. That means anyone who has a message, an input message in a signature pair can verify it. Um, so you don't have to share secret keys uh, quite widely. You can have uh, other entities in the system verify the signatures that are not the signer. Um, and that seems like it would at least uh, check two of the item or two of the applications on the, the previous slide off. Um, and there are a number of uh, blind signature schemes that exist in practice. Uh, so we have blind Schnorr signatures, small asterisk because uh, uh, some of those are, are not such great shape right now. Uh, blind BLS based on pairings, um, Abe paper, um, uh, and then of course, Sean blind RSA. Um, and, and there are others as well, I'm sure, uh, if not, uh, included here, the mean for this list to be exhaustive. Um, next slide, please. Uh, and there's a lot of, um, uh, in, in looking at the landscape, there are a lot of trade offs and considerations um, that we might take into account. So, for example, for BLS, um, which is really quite elegant, um, it's uh, uh, very easy to specify. Um, uh, very easy, I guess, to reason about, but uh, based on pairings um, uh, being perhaps not as widely di distributed or as widely used as we would like, like they're not they're not in you know most major libraries like Boring SSL, Ring, etc. Um, that's sort of an, a barrier to adoption. Um, they also have more expensive signing and verification costs. Um, Schnorr is also really nice, uh, super lightweight, threshold friendly. Um, see Frost, and uh, Chelsea's going to talk about that later. Um, uh, it does have the downside in that um, it requires three messages. Uh, first, the server commits to a nonce, and then, and then the actual client server engage in the, uh, the signature computation. Um, and working around that um, uh, perhaps requires a state on the server side uh, or uh, additional computation overhead. Um, but perhaps more importantly, um, there's this uh, pretty great paper um, from Thorpe Soaps at Google and elsewhere uh, where they uh, effectively uh, broke a number of variants of blind shore signature schemes. Um, uh, and I, well, I think it's at Eurocrypt actually this year, where it's being, where it was accepted. But um, all of this say, like, uh, th this this gives us pause about blind Schnorr right now. There is, um, though, a, a very promising uh, sort of patch uh, that was published last year um, that does seem plausible um, and, and a way forward. Um, uh, but uh, give, given the state of affairs, it, it, it gives us sort of concern. Um, uh, and then we have, I guess, RSA. Um, RSA is, uh, of course, widely supported for obvious reasons. Um, it does have the downside that, you know, it's uh, large signature sizes, um, larger than elliptic curves. Um, it is not easy to threshold. Um, it's RSA. Um, I, I, there's sort of several. Cons, but um, one of the very nice, uh, some of the very nice properties about it are that um, it does uh, run in a single round, so um, completely stateless issuance uh, on the server side. So I can run the protocol uh, without any additional state, and I can scale uh, a, 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 as needed effectively. Um, but importantly, um, in considering the impact of the ecosystem and uh, adopting something like blind uh, RSA signatures, um, support for verification is already. Uh, uh, already widely supported. So really only the sort of generation side needs to change, um, uh, which is uh, a compelling property. Next slide, please. So the, the protocol basically works as follows. Um, the client uh, gets out of band um, the server's public key, um, SKS in this particular case, and with this particular public key and a message, feeds it into this blind function um, to, produce, to produce some blinded output, shoots that over to the server, who then signs it um, with its private key and sends that back to uh, the client who removes the blind and produces the signature and can verify the signature in real time and drop it if it's invalid or not. Um, uh, quite simple. And this it, is it like a one-to-one -one mapping effectively with the uh, 
OPRF and VOPRF API, um, especially the VOPRF API, because the client needs the knowledge of the server's public key in order to actually verify things. Um, uh, so uh, this should sort of be a drop-in kind of replacement for applications that are already built on VOPRFs uh, that require this additional um, public verifiability step. Uh, next slide, please. Um, of course, being RSA, there are a number of uh, potential pitfalls. Um, uh, perhaps most importantly is to, or, or perhaps uh, first on everyone's, uh, top on everyone's mind is uh, what encoding function do we use? Um, and there are a number of variants, be it PSS, uh, full domain hash, um, or PKCS. Um, and in looking at the different options um, uh, and looking at the sort of uh, the literature, it seems safest uh, and it, well, it seems safe to go with either PSS or full domain hash. Um, and the, the determination between which of those two we went with uh, was largely dependent on um, availability in existing libraries, uh, especially in the verification path, where in PSS signature verification code is already, it, it's definitely in most of the major TLS stack libraries uh, by virtue of TLS. Um, and it also supports um, the randomized and deterministic signature switch to application one by changing uh, what the salt is. Um, uh, of course, like uh, this is, we could probably go either way here. Uh, we don't feel super strongly about PSS versus FDH. Um, and there was a lively discussion on the mailing list about which of these encoding functions is best. And um, uh, so I'd be curious to hear what people think about that. Um, next slide, please. Uh, so the current status, uh, we have uh, several interoperable implementations. Um, we test vectors in the draft. Um, it's, it's a very simple thing to implement. Um, many people have done it. Uh, uh, and um, we think the, the, the spec has written is, is quite stable. Um, uh, and given that it solves uh, this spe a specific charter item in the privacy pass working group, um, and that is uh, the ability to instantiate um, or to uh, invoke privacy pass and produce tokens that are publicly verifiable. Um, uh, we think there's perhaps wider interest um, outside of CFRG uh, for this particular construction. Next slide, please. Mm -hmm. So the two questions for the group are, uh, I guess, first and foremost, um, is there interest in working on blind signatures? Um, given sort of the, the activity on the list, uh, the answer would appear to be yes. Um, and, um, and the second question is, assuming yes, is there interest in uh, adopting this document as a starting point? And with that, I will uh, pause for questions. Uh, thanks a lot, Chris. Uh, so do I understand correctly that uh, um, you would uh, like to ask uh, the group whether there is interest in, in adopting the document uh, and uh, on any other ways of working on the topic itself, right? Yes. Uh, one small question from my side. Uh, well, I can provide sorry? them if, if there are questions about the dog as well. I can provide them. If they're actually, um, Thank you. If they're actually uh, please. Christy? I couldn't hear over the dog. It's very cute. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, you said that this solves their privacy pass charter item to support public um, verifiability. So just wondered, yes. um, have you had presumably discussions with the privacy pass group about this? Like, do you know that this is a solution they would want to pursue? Um, has it had any airing there? Just kind of a question on like, is this like one solution among many they're considering or do they not have a solution currently? Thanks. Yeah. Uh, it, um, Blind RSA, there, there was a thread on public verifiability in the privacy path mailing list. Um, there was no clear sort of consensus in terms of which construction um, was, uh, uh, I guess, actually desired, but I see Ben's in the queue, so um, maybe he has a better, uh, being the chair, perhaps he's a better answer. Hi, Ben Schwartz, privacy path chair. Um, so, yeah, I was just going to say the, the same thing. There was a discussion on the, uh, the question of using the scheme in the context of privacy pass. I would 
characterize that as you know positive interest in that possibility from the working group. Um, RSA specifically wasn't mentioned. That thread was focused on the the BLS um, algorithm, but I uh, I I think the the working group at least overall is is interested in um, is interested in in at least looking at blind signatures and having a, a concrete format to to talk about them. Yeah, I guess that kind of answers my question in as much as like there's interest in looking at blind signatures, but not like agreement on blind RSA as the as the way forward. Did I understand that right? Tell me. So in, in the privacy pass charter, there is, um, I, I think it's, uh, I'd have to go look at the text again, but I believe it's fairly clear that the, the charter is not meant to select a uh, a single algorithm it's it's uh, intended to have some degree of crypto agility so i think um i, I think that privacy pass is um is i think not not really likely to to formally exclude uh, any particular suitable algorithm yeah just to follow up on that um uh, in working on the protocol, the privacy pass protocol spec, um, we're we're trying to make uh, sort of high level accommodations for any underlying cryptographic primitive uh, that that's, that has different properties in terms of like what sort of public metadata it supports, whether or not it's publicly verifiable or not. And we'll talk about those in the session later today. Um, uh, but this seems very very much like something um, uh, a situation where a CFRG would present a candidate, um, and then uh, provided that it's, it's suitable, privacy pass would just wrap around it. Uh, Tommy? Tommy? Hello, this is Tommy Pollock from Apple. Um, so, I mean, blind signatures is definitely something that we are interested in, and I have a strong interest in having, you know, at, at least one good solution in this area. To the overall point of adoption use on this, I want to highlight um, a comment from the chat from John Matson and. I think the key point here is that yes, you know, it, it looks like doing blind signatures is important. And if, I want to highlight, like, if we do this, we don't want to rule out other types of blind signatures. I, I view this as, for all the reasons that Chris pointed out, a very um, easy one to specify that could get testing and deployment, and we don't think has obvious problems. Um, with security or tax, but it would be essentially the first flavor of it. So for people who want to do early blind signatures that are publicly verifiable for privacy pass or other applications, we could specify it, use it, ship it, but then probably also expect to specify other blind signature algorithms in the future that people would shift to. Um, but having this in the suite, in the arsenal of things we can use, I believe would be a very positive step. Yeah, um, just want to also follow up on that. I mean, this is being used, like a variant of blind RSA is being used um, in production for a number of products. Um, like the Google VPN that was, came out recently uses this. Um, uh, and, and yeah, it, it, it seems safe. People are, are, are comfortable with RSA um, enough right now. Definitely don't want to like rule out uh, future improvements, but um, this like seems like something that we could do now um, and would um, uh, solve pretty real use cases. So, uh, Ben. So, uh, no hat. The the VOPRF drafts here specify an abstract VOPRF API. Um, I think there's you know obviously been tremendous success with the same approach with HPKE, specifying a, a generalized set of of requirements and and an, an API for talking about them uh is what do you see the the final state for that with blind signatures do we just reuse the the voprf api do we need to adjust the the voprf draft to specify that this api covers both um basic voprfs and blind signature schemes um so it's a good question um uh 
I'm the, the intent was to make the shape of this API very similar to the, that of the VOPRF. Um, but I'm hesitant to, to try to fold it in um, uh, specifically because uh, the sort of semantics of the two constructions are different um, with this public verifiability difference. Um, ideally, or at least ideally to me, um, the, the the difference um, would be sort of at the, the 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 layer above that calls into one of these APIs. So um, uh, we, like we might accommodate um, uh, like the the public verifiability aspect, um, or whether or not there's public metadata or not in the computation at the at the privacy fast level, um, uh, and and not in this particular not in the VOPRF doc and not specifically in the blind RSA doc. Um, okay. So just as a sort of layering question uh, for privacy pass, I think it would be great to have a, a clear abstraction boundary that we're supposed to use because privacy pass probably shouldn't be directly referencing blind RSA per se. Yeah, um, we're, we're going to have to, I, I, like part of the problem with privacy pass is that we, did, we haven't yet gone through the exercise of uh, uh, sort of composing it with different underlying cryptographic constructions yet. Um, but now that we have uh, uh, like one candidate in blind uh, blind RSA signatures, um, and uh, there's also like the PMB token as well, and then like Facebook's private stats protocol as well. We now have like the the opportunity to figure out how what the API boundaries are. Um, so uh, uh, right now it seems like nothing will change in these particular documents, um, but uh, maybe it will depending on how that exercise goes. So, so uh, but thanks for pointing that out. So we'll cut the cut the queue after Frederick. I'd uh, like to cut the queue after Frederick. So please, Watson. Uh, Watson, lad, Cloudflare. Um, there is a difference between the semantics of a blind signature and, and no PRF. Uh, we can we can talk about this on a list, but I don't think they should have the same API because they provide different properties. It's going to be very similar, but they're they're subtly different. I guess. Um, I mean, one of Ben's like potential points is that you could instantiate or simulate an OPRF with a blind signature. In fact, one of the Jarecki's early results basically demonstrate that you can do so safely. But I, I agree, like the, the semantics are different enough at a lower level that perhaps pulling them into the same API is not best. Uh, Fred? Uh, I, I just wanted to, to make a note about the fact that we don't want to generalize the construction too quickly either, um, especially because some of the alternatives and um, other papers require multiple step issuance or there might be some semantic differences there. So um, maybe we, we can see a bit like what other alternatives there are to RSA. And once we have confidence that we could come up with the right abstraction for it, then we we could move towards adopting that. But um, if in the short term we're going to be using RSA, um, I think that building an abstraction on top of it, if it's not clear that future scheme might be um, providing the same abstraction, doesn't seem wise. Um. So yeah, everyone should come to the privacy pass later today where we'll talk about these API things. Uh, that, so, I hope that we can take it to the list. I think that uh, there is quite a fruitful discussion and I think it should continue. So uh, we'll send a message to the list about uh, the possible working on this item. Uh, thanks a lot. Please, Chelsea, threshold signatures. Sure thing. I, I actually have a lot of slide transitions, so I don't know if it's easier for me to share directly. Okay. Let me see Go if I can do that. Okay, how is this? Uh, we hope to see them soon. Oh, sorry. Uh -huh. We don't see them now. Maybe you should uh, select them all. Yep. Sorry. Well, let me try one more time. Okay. 
Yes, we're safe by Okay, great. <laughs> okay, hi, um, I'm Chelsea, and I'm giving, giving the update on our draft of FROST, and FROST stands for Flexible RAM Optimized Schnorr Threshold Signatures. Um, so just a quick summary about what FROST is, in case you're not familiar with it. Um, it's a two-round Schnorr Threshold Signing Protocol, or it can be optimized to a single round with pre-processing. And one thing that's kind of interesting about FROST is that it specifically trades off robustness for round efficiency. Um, signing operations in FROST are secure even when they're performed concurrently, so this improves upon prior work in the literature against an adversary that controls up to T minus one signers. And um, <clears throat> in FROST, uh, key generation can be performed either by a trusted dealer, um, just by straight Shamir secret sharing, or by a distributed uh, key generation or a DKG protocol. So that's kind of in a nutshell what, what FROST is. So the current status, um, so it was adopted as a working group item at the end of January, so relatively soon. So with that, uh, we're working on the first draft and we're focusing on the implementation details that are not specified in the paper. Um, so really, we're going through right now and just kind of fleshing out V1 and um, talking to people who've implemented FROST and trying to like flesh out those details. Um, another thing sort of externally to this effort is we're writing a second proof of security using standard assumptions. So something that came out of FROST and some similar uh, protocols like MUSIG um, and a few others is that uh, the, the approaches to proving these kind of quite complicated schemes like multi-signatures is not quite standard. So we're working on a way to standardize uh, these proofs of security. And um, something that's exciting is there's uh, actually several parallel implementations of Frost in both Rust and Go. Um, so I recently was notified of one that was put out by uh, JP Almasan's group. <laughs> um, so uh, there's definitely a lot of independent interest in Frost, and, and people are implementing it right now. So I think that's a that's a really positive sign. Um, I'm going to summarize some of the feedback that we got from the call for adoption. Uh, so the the paper for Frost sort of assumed a prime order curve. Uh, the feedback that we got in the call for adoption is that. Um, there was desire for ed DSA compatibility, so over curves like 25519 and 448. Um, one thing I want to point out is that compatibility in this case will be for verification of signatures specifically. So, <clears throat> and this isn't super widely known, but using ed DSA style deterministic nonces is actually insecure in a multi signer setting. Um, so we've had questions like, is it possible to do deterministic frost? And it's not. So our draft will specify signatures that are compatible with verification in, I think it's RFC 8032 that specifies um, these signature formats. Uh, another piece of feedback we got is that pre-processing might be difficult to perform securely. So that first round might be tricky because it's super important that uh, nonces are only used once. So um, this is something we're thinking about, and um, as I'll talk later, uh, we're planning just to specify the two-round scheme in our draft. Another thing we got is that it would be nice to sort of have the option to either use the trusted dealer, key gen, or the DKG. So the next steps for us, um, so we'll be fleshing out our V1, um, so expect to see a full draft soon. Uh, we do need to start testing interoperability between implementations. And then, as I said before, um, we do need to adapt the draft to curves with cofactors. So <clears throat> we've looked at this just sort of in very briefly, but things we need to do is uh, specify point validation during signing as um, required by, by these curves and um, making sure that our signatures are verification compatible. So uh, expect to see that in our next update. So um, our roadmap for the draft, uh, within the core draft, like I said, we'll be specifying um, with a trusted dealer. I think that's kind of the easiest um, key generation option and I think uh, sort of commonly desired. Uh, we'll just be doing the two round scheme for simplicity. And um, we do have the concept of a signature aggregator, so we'll be specifying them as a non-signing party. 
So they could be a signing party if they want to, but we'll be keeping these concepts separate. Um, one thing I wanted to mention that for just general interest within the working group as possible future extensions beyond Frost, uh, one thing is that of pre-processing. So as I said, single round signing is possible in Frost, but there can be some sharp edges because it's important that nonsense are used once. So I think this is something that's worth considering um, after we do this work. Uh, another thing is specifying this DKG. So this DKG could possibly be more generally useful beyond just Frost. And so we wanted to put out this out there as um, something that you know the working group or the research group might be interested in, but kind of more general. And then finally, um, something that's forgotten about all the time, but that's really extremely useful for threshold signatures or just threshold schemes in general, is that of share recovery or the ability to add new participants. So these algorithms exist. Um, they're well known. They've been around for a long time. Um, so I think maybe considering this as an extension might be helpful for failure recovery in practice. Uh, and with that, I'll take questions. Yes, uh, Peter? Yeah, I. Uh, you said you, you you're focusing on the dealer version. Mm -hmm. Uh, I'd like to encourage you to also consider the case where you have a crypto pro coprocessor built into the CPU mm -hmm. and you want an application program to be able to securely delegate a partial uh, threshold operation of a signature to the CPU so that then we can bind the operations to the CPU. And the reason for that is that uh, I believe that there's going to be a, a requirement out there fairly soon for that type of processor. And signature is going to be one of three functions that is going to be really important to get uh, presented as a package. Okay. Uh, so are you advocating for the DKG then so that these are two, I mean, the, the, key, the key generation is distributed or? Um... Uh, <clears throat> Uh, the, yes, the, the key generation will be dis distributed, but doesn't need to be distributed using Shamir and whatever. It's just a question of being able to bind a signature key to a particular device so that you know that if the device is lost, the ability to create that signature uh, is also lost. You can't extract, uh, you can't take a backup and then uh, use that to create signatures unless you've also got the device. Okay, um, I think that's a specific use case, so I'm happy to uh, have a, another discussion in more detail about that, so. Yes, yeah, the use case, not the implementation. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Hi, thanks for the presentation, Chelsea. Um, just, uh, just wanted to pick up on this point about the DKG here. Um, uh, and jokes about Daniel Khan Gilmore aside, um, it's an interesting point that the DKG here is pretty separable. Um, your suggestion here is that that might be useful to uh, use other places. What I wonder is whether we might be able to simplify this draft by not including the DKG, um, or if you think that the DKG is you know, kind of structurally intertwined with the signing algorithm, and it's worth keeping for that reason. No, it's definitely not intertwined. And actually, yeah, I completely agree. So within the core draft, I am I think we should just specify the trusted dealer, um, and then say also if you want to do something more exotic like a DKG, here's what we expect for all the participants at the end of key gen. That's pretty simple. Um, so yeah, I do think the DKG probably belongs in its own realm. Um, and because there's a lot like there's a lot of things you can use it for. And as long as we get keys for all the participants that fulfill um, certain properties, then I think it's fine for it to be external. Yeah, cool. That, that, I think that could simplify the draft a, a fair bit. Thanks a lot. 
uh, will be having the schedule. So thanks a lot, Chelsea. Uh, let's go to the next item. That's kick and eat in EADs. Uh, please, Julia. Uh, Nick, could you please share Julia's thoughts? Thanks a lot, Nick. Uh, Julia, please start. Okay, thanks. Um, so today I'll be laying out how real-world vulnerabilities have arisen because of non-committing AAD schemes, as well as discussing the current key committing AAD landscape and how we can hopefully head towards a standard. So next slide, please. So here I'll broadly discuss authenticated encryption and to keep things simple, I'll ignore nonces and associated data in this presentation. So here in the setting, we have a client and a server and they both share a secret key. The client chooses a plain text message and encrypts it using its secret key to produce a ciphertext. Next slide, please. And the client sends the ciphertext over to the server who can then decrypt to recover the plain text using its own secret key. And of course, we expect that an attacker who sees the ciphertext won't be able to recover the plain text without having access to the secret key. Next slide, please. And there are many popular AAD schemes out there, uh, such as AESGCM and XLSA20 Poly1305, among others. And they're popular for good reason. They are efficient, they're standardized, and they're widely supported by many libraries. They also guarantee many security properties, such as confidentiality and integrity, and they've been proven chosen ciphertext attack secure. But there's one security property that they don't target, which is, next slide please, thanks. Uh, it's robustness, or also called committing AAD. Next slide, please. So in a non-committing AAD scheme, um, you can produce a ciphertext such that it can decrypt under two different keys. So next slide, please. So this becomes an issue in what we call partitioning oracle attacks. So this is a new class of attacks that I've worked on with my co-authors, Paul Grubbs and Tom Rissenpart, and this will appear at ESNIC Security this year. In this attack, you can create a ciphertext that decrypts under multiple keys, not just two and its goal is to perform efficient password or key recovery. So here now in the setting, an attacker wants to learn the key is stored um, by server, and the attacker has access um, to a set of possible keys and wants to learn which one the server is using. So the attacker can create a ciphertext such that it decrypts under half the keys. The attacker then queries, um, next slide please. The attacker queries the key, um, the ciphertext to the server, and the server tries to decrypt using its own key. So next slide, please. And here the server was able to successfully decrypt because its key was in the set. So now the attacker learns that it can eliminate half um, of the keys in its key set, thereby um, reducing. Um, so next slide, please. So notice that this means they had that the attacker can learn one bit of information about the key because of this non-committing AAD scheme that's used here. Next slide, please. So we found that these attacks were practical and looked at a few schemes in depth, including Shadowsox proxy servers, as well as early implementations of opaque. And we found that there were um, vulnerabilities um, or possible partitioning oracles elsewhere, including an HP, HPKE, as well as Agate file encryption tool, among others. Um, and there have been other vulnerabilities stemming from non-committing AAD as well, including in Facebook Messenger's content um, moderation message ranking scheme, as well as a few services by Google and Amazon, um, which were found by researchers at Google and Amazon last year. So really, this all shows that there's a growing body of evidence that non-committing AAD can lead to vulnerabilities. Next slide, please. So then the natural question is, what do we use for a key committing AAD scheme? Next slide, please. And this is a bit hard to answer currently because there's no scheme standardized. Um, next slide, please. 
but there have been a few schemes suggested. Uh, this includes the zeros block check scheme, uh, which modifies an AAD scheme to check that a block of recovered plain text is an all zero string. So this has currently been adopted by Libsodium, but it does incur an extra overhead uh, by adding 64 bytes to each cipher text. There's also the hash key check, which modifies an AAD scheme to check a SHA-256 hash of the key during decryption. This has been adopted by the AWS encryption SDK, but again, it incurs uh, this extra overhead over the base scheme by adding 32 bytes. Um, another scheme uh, suggested is the single key encrypt in HMAC, which doesn't have any extra overhead because it is the base scheme, but potentially could be less efficient than these alternatives. Um, and while the implementations to our knowledge don't have any sort of side channel, it could be that the zeros block check and hash key check could have some side channels uh, if they're implemented incorrectly. And the zeros block check would also need to be implemented and analyzed separately for each AAD scheme. So each of these schemes sort of has their own pros and cons. Um, next slide, please. So currently there's some questions in this space. So uh, Chris Wood, Paul Garbs, Thomas Support, and I are planning to start a draft for key committing AAD. So we would love to hear your thoughts about needs and requirements surrounding this. Um, so thank you very much, and I'm happy to take any questions. One thing for open is that uh, if we move to the uh, discussion at the, of adoption of uh, this um, as a work item, um, we will uh, do this uh, as, a, as uh, some work uh, of some framework of uh, uh, making of uh, key committing AD mode from any strong and secure uh, AD, uh, right? So we don't want to uh, specify some uh, specific um, key committing AD modes uh, with uh, some for example, with some cha-cha or, or something, so just some framework that can uh, help to build a uh, key committing AAD from any secure AAD, right? Um, yeah, we, we yeah. can suggest that, but there's also, um, for instance, like encrypt and HMAC as a standalone AAD scheme would work. We could also, uh, in the draft, specify these sorts of transforms and uh, be specific about the trade-offs with these multiple schemes, um, but that's one way to go. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, please, Richard. Yeah, just on the question of um, what schemes to standardize here, um, I think that it might be uh, plausible to take a kind of short-term and long-term view here. Um, I think the, the uh, just encrypt plus HMAC is probably the, the easy quick win here because there's already a fair bit of prior art and deployment out there that would benefit from standardization and security analysis to make sure that the construction is put together the right way. There's, there's like a few different ways that people put together uh, uh, encrypt and HMAC to, to come up with an AD, what, what they believe to be an AD, which uh, is not in all, all cases. So like having a standardized construction for that, I think would be useful and fairly straightforward to put together. Um, but I think it could also be useful to, um, you know, to explore some of the other design space here. Um, I, I, I'm obviously less familiar with, with what the opportunities there are, but I think that, that we could do two things here and it wouldn't be too crazy. Yeah, that's a great suggestion. Um, yeah, I, I would love to see a, a single key encrypt in HMAC standard. Um, there aren't any to my knowledge, so um, having that as a source for people to refer to for committing AAD would, would be great. I, I have sketched one in the, the worker doing the S frameworking group. Um, oh, I will great. post a link in the chat. I would love to get that in, uh, analyzed and like uh, vetted by someone who is better at this than I am. Yeah, that'd be great. Thanks. Well, thanks. We'll have to cut the queue after Benjamin uh, because we already have a schedule. Uh, Martin, please. So thanks for going through this. This is the um, question I had was pretty simple. The um, two options you had with zero pad and uh, I forget the other one, um, had fixed overheads. Uh, yeah, the hash key check, they had a fixed overhead. And it seems to me obvious that the hash key check, um, that the strength of that is based on the strength of the, um, the number of bytes that you provide. Is there a version of this 
can you put 32 bytes in the ciphertext in the zero block check and get a similar result? Or is this, you have to have a full block of some thing? Because that's 64 bytes, it's four blocks of AES, for instance. Don't quite understand how that's working. So the, um, the reason it's 64 bytes is because um, Libsodium is using, I think, Xchacha 20 ply 1305, and their uh, single block of ciphertext is 64 bytes. So they just um, made an all zero string for 64 bytes, but you certainly don't need um, that many bytes. Um, but so, so that would be helpful to first standard to say how long of a zero string you would actually need. Right, that was, that was my intuition as well. So thanks for confirming that. Benjamin, please. My my understanding is that this is an attack against low entropy key spaces. Uh, is that correct? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I think something that would be really valuable here from CFRG is a a formal recommendation about the minimum entropy of key space to use with uh, AESGCM or or the existing AADs. Oh, yeah, that's a great suggestion. Um, I'll take note of that. Uh, okay, we'll take it to the list. Thanks a lot, Juna. That was a great presentation. Uh, thank you. And yes. the last item for today, uh, Sabot, uh, we'll pair off with public metadata. Uh, are you ready? Um, I'm not sure that Sabot is here. I don't see Sabot in the list. Uh, Chris, maybe you present because you're one of the authors. Uh, sure. Um, let me, yes, that, sure, yes, I'm happy to do so if he's not here. Um, okay. Um, yeah, sorry, paging everything in. Um, so uh, this is uh, an extension that the uh, Sabod and Anand put together and along with their colleagues for uh, extending the existing DOPRF construction uh, to accommodate uh, public metadata into the output of the OPRF evaluation. Um, uh, the motivations for this are uh, primarily privacy paths in this particular case, um, which has an issue, um, uh, the, the issue referenced here, um, for accommodating metadata um, uh, both on the client side as well as on the server side. Um, you know, the, the, I guess the dimensions of the metadata are still like a topic of discussion in privacy paths. Um, uh, but it, generally, there, there, there is not yet a construction uh, that exists for uh, safely folding in this types of metadata. And there's lots of different types of metadata you might want to use. Um, so, for example, you could, if you wanted to uh, bound the sort of the scope. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, go back to the previous slide. Um, uh, you might want to bound the scope of the OPRF evaluation um, by including like an expiration timestamp or something as public metadata or, or something else um, to constrain uh, uh, or to sort of augment the, uh, the output. Um, we'll note that there's like a naive way to do this. Um, and that is to just say, uh, for each bit of metadata, have a unique public key. Um, but that doesn't scale very well. Um, and, uh, for, um, privacy reasons, we don't want to have many keys floating around. Um, so, uh, next slide, please. Right. Um, so the the basic idea is to um, rather than just um, run the VOPRF with a, a sort of fixed uh, public key, um, to derive the public key uh, based on public metadata. Um, so in this construction, there is a, a main public key and a main private key, um, and there is uh, attributes that are represented as bit vectors, um, and the uh, from each bit vector, you can derive uh, a unique key pair that can then be used directly in the existing VOP of construction um, without augmentation at all. Um, uh, if you advanced one slide, um, the the 
key point here is that the derivation um, from root or main public key to an attribute or metadata specific uh, key pair uh, is verifiable um, using sort of the similar uh, discrete log equality proofs that we have in the VOPREF doc right now. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, uh, yeah, I don't really want to say much more than that. Um, um, summary of its properties, it, it is not uh, it's not depending on any pet pairings, which is quite nice. Um, see previous uh, RSA talk about why uh, blind BLS does not currently work for many applications. Um, uh, it's based on sort of um, well understood um, uh, PRF constructions and, and it folds, a, it very, very nicely extends the existing um, uh, proof construction mechanisms in the view of PRF document. Um, the, all the key derivation stuff can actually happen offline. Um, uh, the, which, depending, depending on the size of the metadata, that could be uh, quite advantageous considering um, that the, uh, the, the proofs needed for uh, um, checking that a particular derivation is correct um, scale uh, with the number of bits in metadata. So uh, I, I like typical applications um, or, or expected applications um, might use anywhere from like eight to 32 bits of metadata, which is reasonable to do offline and then, and then cache on the server or on the client, sorry. Um, and um, so all this is to say the, this, um, you can handle metadata um, quite easily um, offline and then run sort of the, the, the super efficient uh, the OPR protocol online um, and the output uh, the, the result of combining these two is you have now the PRF with um, public metadata folded in. Um, next slide, please. What did he want to say here? Um, um, not sure what, he, I mean, it doesn't make much sense, I guess, to go into the details. Um, yeah, I guess we can just talk about the comparison. Um, so, uh, uh, as I was saying earlier, it's it's possible to 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 do this sort of um, key based metadata construction right now in a naive way. Um, you can have a single bit of uh, metadata uh, for a particular key. Um, however, that like scales, as I said, quite poorly. Um, for n bits, you have n public keys, um, and there's no proof um, that the, the the key is actually correct. Um, uh, but this would be, uh, of course, compatible with the uh, VOPRF draft because you you just have a, a pile of keys you use and you pick which one uh, depending on which uh, like which value of your metadata you want. Um, compare this to something like Pythia, uh, which is a pairing-based uh, uh, OPRF that does also include public metadata, um, has constant size, um, uh, public keys, and compute overhead, but it is based on pairings. Um, and, and as a result, different hardness assumptions and different availability and implementation difficulty. Um, um, the attribute-based VOPRF, which is the, the sort of the construction right here, um, uh, has a logarithmic uh, public key size. Um, uh, and the, I, 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 depending on, um, I guess, the, the number of bits in your metadata that can be um, I guess good or bad, uh, and uh, as I said, all this can kind of happen offline. Um, and uh, I mean, it, there are there was a, another recent result um, uh, a, a couple weeks ago. I don't recall exactly when it came out. Um, uh, that has a, a, a different alter, a different construction for folding in public metadata that does not derive it from the the, the keys itself, but rather uh, augments the, the the OPRF evaluation key uh, based on metadata, and then um, uh, slightly changes how the the discrete log or the, uh, the 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 VOPRF proof is generated. Um, this is uh, great in that um, public key size is uh, still constant. Um, there's not like log for each attributes. Um, uh, uh, but it does not fold easily into the VOPRF draft currently um, uh, because it requires changes to the proof. It also requires changes to the OPRF, uh, like the private key evaluation in line with the protocol. Um, 
And also there's no, there's no uh, like API slot for folding in uh, metadata right now. Um, at, the, at, the, at the API level of actually uh, doing the evaluation on the server side. Um, uh, whereas with the, with the proposal here, um, the, the metadata could be folded into the public key generation uh, step and verification step that happens before the VOPR protocol is run, um, which is a, a nice alternative. It was also pointed out in the privacy pass list. Oh, sorry. Um, it was also pointed out in the privacy pass list that one could use um, uh, as an alternative to the uh, single bit per metadata key solution. One could optimize that slightly by using Merkle trees. So, for example, you could have um, uh, each. Uh, you, you imagine you had like a list of keys, um, where each uh, each key is leaf in a tree, um, and um, uh, imagine you built like a Merkle tree on top of that, uh, and uh, you gave clients um, the sign tree head, or effectively the tree head in this particular case, and then in uh, running like the VOPR protocol, what you give them as sort of uh, proof of the, the key to use is uh, uh, the leaf key, the leaf public key itself, which is just like a single element along with the, the path to the root. Um, uh, or the co-path to the root, uh, so they can verify that it was uh, correctly included um, in the in the tree. Um, but this is more just an optimization in terms of um, you know working around the the huge uh, pile of keys um, in the naive method. Um, but um, maybe something worth documenting. Um, next slide, please. <coughs> um, yeah. So the the question for the group is. Um, uh, at first, is there interest in um, you know a VOPF variant with public metadata? Um, it, there certainly seems to be a, a number of instances that I'm aware of where uh, being able to fold in something uh, at crypto, pu something public that is cryptographically bound to the OPRF output uh, would be really nice. Um, so I hope the answer to this is yes. Um, uh, and I guess if if so. Um, uh, uh, what are, what sort of I guess assumptions are we comfortable with uh, relying on uh, for the um, uh, for supporting this? So, for example, the 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 attribute based uh, the OPRF variant that that is this uh, particular presentation um, has a, um, a a different hardness assumption from the the more recent um, anonymous tokens draft um, or paper that uh, was discussed in the privacy pass mailing list. Um, Unclear what the the difference is in uh, uh, in hardness assumptions, uh, what the sort of uh, high level impact is on uh, the security of the scheme, um, and it's unclear which of these uh, we're comfortable with standardizing now. Uh, uh, also, uh, because this draft sort of extends the existing APIs and the the, the shape and mechanics of the VOPRF draft without any modification. Um, uh, I guess we're just generally interested to know if um, uh, this is something the the research group would be interested in uh, working on and adopting, um, either as a separate draft or folding into the existing draft. Um, I think both seem pretty reasonable. So, um, apologize for clobbering that together. I didn't I didn't expect to present. <laughs> uh, thanks a lot, Chris. That was a great presentation, despite the fact that you haven't planned to do this. Uh, thank you again. Uh, we have. Uh, time only for one question, I, I think. Yes, Peter. There, there, there's a note um, uh, from Nick in that the term attribute base might be super confusing. Uh, totally agree. Um, uh, I, 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 it's officially called the attribute based OPRF in the paper, but uh, it's really just an OPRF with public metadata. So, um, yeah, we can fix the name. Fred? Abstractions, would Here. there be oh. the possibility to abstract uh, the key augmentation part uh, mechanism outside of like any use case for VOPRFs? Because I think there's a potential application for this to build a partially blinded signature scheme uh, from an EC based uh, blind signature scheme using the same mechanism. I, I, 
I didn't catch like the first couple bits, but what I think I heard you say is, um, could we like generalize this particular like key derivation, verify key derivation uh, mechanism, uh, and and perhaps use it in other contexts like for signature schemes or whatnot. Um, uh, I believe the answer is yes, um, because the the key derivation um, mechanism is not specific to the OPRF in any way. It just it's a it's a way to deterministically and verifiably derive keys um, that uh, are can be used in OPRF protocols, but could also be used in like other uh, EC based things for point signatures and whatnot. So yeah, I think um, it, it's general in that way, um, and that's actually a good point and perhaps. Um, a reason why it, it might be best left out of the VOPRF draft right now. Uh, thanks a lot. Uh, Chris, could you please uh, uh, move these questions to the mailing list? Uh, we don't have any time to discuss them now, unfortunately. Yes, absolutely. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot again to Chris. Uh, so, five minutes for any other business. Any comments, questions? So we have four minutes more, so maybe any comments about the presentations we had today? Um, yes. I, I have a, a question. Oh, Phil was in the before. Oh, yes, Phil from first. Philip, we don't hear your audio. Philip, we don't hear you. Yeah. Uh, yes. You can hear me now? Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. Okay. I was just going to ask about the threshold encryption. And uh, I, I put in a draft, and I was told there was going to be a uh, thing on the list, and it never happened. And then I was promised it again, and it never happened. Uh, it's been over a year now. Um, uh, it's not for lack of prodding the uh, chairs of the working group. Uh, you know, when we went over the threshold stuff uh, this time last year, uh, we agreed that you know we would take it to the list and there'd be discussion there and. Um, it, there was discussion, and there was never uh, uh, it was never put to the list whether the group should uh, uh, consider the threshold encryption draft. Um, I'm sure that there was a conclusion of all our discussions about uh, all threshold stuff in the moment, least from Nick. Maybe Nick can comment on this. Yeah, so we had we discussed the threshold signatures as a topic, um, and we haven't gotten to threshold encryption. Uh, that that's my understanding. Right. Well, when are we going to get to it? I mean, you know, I I've been waiting a year. You know, we ha I, I gave a presentation a year ago. Uh, yeah. Does anybody else in the in the working group? or the research group, uh, sorry, have uh, interest in this. I think this is something that we can bring, bring to the list. Um, I, I think the reluctance to do this immediately ha had to do with uh, lack of enthusiasm uh, beyond uh, the requests from one person. So if other, other folks in this meeting have uh, interest in this particular topic as uh, something that CFRG should uh, should approach, I encourage you to uh, step to the mic line. And we have only one minute left, so maybe a last comment from Chris. Yeah, this was just a, uh, I wanted to follow up on something Jorm was discussing or proposed earlier in the uh, in a CPACE presentation, uh, specifically around like reference uh, standard reference implementations for the VOPRF hash to curve um, and the PAID protocols. Um, should we be doing something here, I guess, sort of uh, from the CFRG's perspective, like trying to collect standard reference implementations for 
each of these things that people can reference. Um, uh, I, for the, the drafts that I, I assist with, uh, we've been using Sage because we, we want to make it very clear that this is something, um, uh, this is code to be used to understand the protocol and the specification. Definitely not something you should ship. Um, uh, and I hope I think Sage is annoying enough to make that very obvious. Uh, but um, th there's there's a good argument to be made that perhaps there should be you know standard C implementations for most of these things um, or Rust, um, uh, as is sort of common in you know uh, these cryptographic competitions and and whatnot. So I, I'm curious to know a if if people are interested in this sort of thing and b um, how we might sort of uh, collaborate and and make it happen. Uh, as potential uh, document shepherd for CPA's draft, I am fully support your point. Uh, could you please uh, take it also to the list because our time is, is out. Uh, Absolutely. Many thanks to everyone. So we have to finish now. Uh, thank you, folks. Bye.